it was very obviously a physiologically based depression and anxiety because my life was awesome and it was just it was just so distinct that um, my my environment and situation in life was not lining up with my um, emotional status and I said there's something wrong with my physiology and I'm gonna figure out what it is because I'm not okay with being upset and sad for no reason I have higher standards than that so um, I have a, a biology uh, bachelor's degree from San Diego State and I became obsessed with investigating the neuroscience literature on the pathology of depression and anxiety um, and was really trying to find a solution through dietary and lifestyle means to avoid being on medications like some of my families have been for their whole lives and they're still not happy. So um, i happy to say was successful in that endeavor and I have cured myself and I've been free of depression and anxiety for uh, quite a while now and it's still a constant learning process and certain foods or things can still trigger me like anyone else but um, for the most part I've really figured out my body's chemistry and how to thrive and this led me to create my current company uh, it's a nutritional supplement company called Entheozen um, some of you might notice it sounds similar to the word entheogen and that's because not only does the, the company cater to mood enhancements um, and supplementation, but I also start dialogue about harm reduction in drug using communities um, and research with psychedelics as medicines and therapeutic applications, especially in the treatments of mood disorders. Um, so that kind of brought me naturally to float tanks. Um, I'm sure you can see the connection. And that's why I'm here. So uh, I'm sure most of you know what floating is by now and kind of have a gist for it. Um, one of the critical features of floating and the float experience is something called REST, REST. Um, it stands for Restricted Environmental Stimulation Technique and it reduces something called relaxation response, which is basically the opposite of the stress response in the body. Uh, which is like the flight or fight um, that makes you feel all wired and crazy and stressed out. So we know that a relaxation response has a lot of observed positive physiological effects, uh, especially on immunological systems, vascular, coronary, um, neurological and mental health as well. And in order to induce relaxation response, there's two things that you need. You need reduced sensory stimulation and reduced body movement. Luckily, float tanks provide both of those things. And um, relaxation response activates the parasympathetic nervous system, um, which is, again, the opposite of the, the sympathetic system, which is the stress response. Um, there's been there's an accumulation of float research happening that confirms um, the benefits of floating on our well-being and there has been a handful of physiological measurements that they've been able to do um, in float research and based on the few studies we have um, you know measuring physiological markers at this point we know that it reduces cortisol um, blood pressure heart rate and it increases theta brain uh, wavelengths um, so in some of the studies, they actually observed that cortisol levels were still reduced even four days after floating, which is pretty cool. And uh, some unpublished studies have suggested that there's also lower levels of uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline uh, as a result of floating as well. Uh, studies have been showing that there is an improvement in conditions such as depression, anxiety, pain, uh, and in promoting overall optimal wellness and um, positivity in people's lives. So, give you a little overview on depression. Um, we know from recent research that depression is most likely driven by inflammation in the body, 
And you know, it's kind of hard to say what came first, the chicken or the egg. Is the inflammation causing the depression or is situational stress and events in your life causing inflammation in your body? There is brain tissue atrophy and shrinkage of uh, certain brain systems that are observed in depressed people. And they also see a tendency for uh, damage to neural structures such as dendrites and synapses, which are vitally important for cell-to-cell -cell communication. Uh, Depression is also highly correlated with neurodegenerative diseases and inflammatory diseases. They're kind of all in the same breed. And what we're learning now is that inflammation is really at the root of a lot of illnesses and diseases that are occurring in our modern world. Um, so neurodegeneration is sort of defined by your tissue being damaged at a faster rate than your body's repair mechanisms are able to regenerate it. So essentially, if you have more inflammation in your body than you do um, the molecules or markers that tell your body to repair these neural structures and brain cells, then you have neurodegeneration. So I asked myself, uh, what's the mechanism for why float tanks are effective in alleviating symptoms of depression and anxiety. And there hasn't been a ton of research done on the biological aspects and effects of flotation. And part of that is, um, one, you know, funding a research project is really expensive and the scientific community is just starting to like figure out this is something they should really pay attention to. And so they're, you know, doing a lot of studies measuring wellness and depression and pain based on questionnaires, but it's kind of, um, you know, a newer thing for them to be able to measure, um, you know, like Dustin was talking about, the electrical activity of people's brains and, you know, it's hard to float and then have blood withdrawn from your arm in the middle of your float to get data like that. It's also really difficult to create an animal model that uh, resembles the float experience because you know you can typically with neuroscience research you can mimic you know a disease or some sort of activity state in a rat say and then you can sacrifice the rat and like slice pieces of its brain look at it under a microscope take measurements do assays but how do you tell a rat to sit and float and relax in a float tank like, it's not happening, right? So we largely only have human, human data to work with, which makes it difficult to find um, more, more answers on the molecular mechanisms for why this is helping people. And there's been a few um, presented theories. One is that there's proprioceptive systems in the brain that are largely responsible for um, motor control and body position and they're reduced because you're not moving and so they, they become less active and this allows the allocation of resources such as glucose and oxygen to nourish other parts of the brain and um, recalibrate things that way. So that's just one of probably many theories that are out there. And um, I asked myself, um, based on my understanding of the literature on the pathology of depression and anxiety, I thought, I wonder if a neuronal growth factor called BDNF is playing a role in this uh, mechanism of action. And I'll tell you a little bit more about BDNF in a second. I know it sounds like some kinky, weird cult or something. But um, first, let me uh, tell you a little about neurogenesis. It's really important and really interesting, I think. So up until recently, um, neuroscientists thought that you know, when you're a baby, you grow all your brain cells, and then you have them all, and that's all you get. And whatever you kill through binge drinking or concussions throughout your life, it, they're just gone. That's, that's the end of it. You just try to salvage as many as you have left, and they slowly die off and leave you with less brain cells. Well, we actually know that's not true now. Um, and even though there was evidence for neurogenesis in around in the 60s, it wasn't really accepted by the scientific, scientific community until the late 90s, early 2000s, which is not that long ago. And uh, the two main areas that we are observing 
neurogenesis um, and you know, stem cells that make brand new neurons in the brain is the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb. Um, olfactory is where you receive um, smell sensory data. So um, back to BDNF, BDNF stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor and it's been a very growing um, topic of interest lately in the neuroscience uh, community. And basically, it's a protein that facilitates the proliferation, differentiation, and maintenance of neurons. So it actually prompts the creation of new neurons as well as helps existing neurons um, prune and regenerate neural structures. Our brains are constantly sort of, you know, pruning the garden saying, eh, we haven't really used this, you know, synapse in a while. We're just going to get rid of it so we can spend energy on this other one that is being used all the time. And they're reinforced based on which pathways we're using on a regular basis. So if you play piano every day, um, then the pathways responsible for that memory are going to be maintained because you're exercising and stimulating those pathways on a regular basis. Um, if you're not doing something on a regular basis, your body says, eh, this doesn't really seem important. We're just going to prune this out. So, um, depression, um, in depression research, they've shown that people with depression typically have low levels of serum BDNF. And uh, depression is considered to be a stress-related illness. And we know that prolonged stress inhibits growth of dendrites and synapses in the nervous system. And again, people with depression tend to have shrunken brain features such as the hippocampus and the amygdala. And that suggests that they are not able to effectively have neurogenesis or repair existing brain cells that have become damaged. And they often have you know, a tremendous amount of dysregulation in neurotransmitter systems as well. So treatments that upregulate this growth factor and protein, BDNF, typically reduce depression and anxiety symptoms and relieve them. And there's a lot of natural ways to um, increase this molecule in the body, such as exercise, meditation, um, listening to music even, fasting. Uh, there's various foods and herbs, such uh, as turmeric is one of my favorites, and compounds found in blueberries, sweet potatoes as well. There's a number of drugs that upregulate this protein, including the psychedelic drugs, you know, LSD, DMT, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, things like that. Uh, and also uh, SSRI drugs, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs that are used to treat depression. They found that it upregulates this protein BDNF. And so lately there's been speculation um, as to you know maybe why these antidepressants are sometimes effective. It has nothing to do with the fact that they're increasing serotonin in the synaptic cleft it might more so be because they're upregulating this neuronal growth factor. And if that's the case, there's a lot of other healthier, uh, easier ways to upregulate this, this protein that don't have nearly as many side effects. So um, I'm wondering, do float tanks elicit this response? And if so, how? Uh, we know that float tanks um, and the floating experience reduce cortisol, and we know that cortisol inhibits the expression of BDNF. And I think by interrupting this stress pathway and the epigenetic changes that it might have on our genes that are expressing this protein and growth factor, we are able to sort of remove the fuel from the fire and really target it at the core of what's going wrong. And by lowering cortisol, you're also lowering your body's amount of inflammation and oxidative stress, which is what damages tissues. And so if you have less damage going on, you have to work less hard to regenerate and regrow it. And you don't need as much of these reparative mechanisms to be at play to maintain a healthy homeostasis. So. Uh, just to support my, my suspected hypothesis, I looked into other 
practices that induce relaxation response. And um, meditation and exercise are really great examples of this. And both of those, we know clinically, improve the symptoms of depression and anxiety. So uh, I asked myself, could flotation be inducing a relaxation response that's creating biological effects that are similar to meditation and flotation? Or excuse me, meditation and exercise. Um, and if this is the case, we could probably assume that it's also upregulating this growth protein, sprouting new dendrites and synapses and new brain cells, making fuller, healthier brain tissue for us. And that would explain one of the mechanisms why it's so effective in treating depression and anxiety. So could this be a mechanism? Uh, I think obviously we need more research and we need better ways of collecting this type of molecular data. And it's a really exciting time to be alive in the field of science because we're exploring all sorts of really neat things right now, um, especially when it comes to relaxation response and altered states of consciousness and trans transcendental states of consciousness. So I'm really eager to hear some of the research talks tomorrow to see what the, the latest and greatest data is on floating. And um, yeah, thanks so much for listening. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah? Um, you had talked about inflammation in the body, and I've been doing a lot of reading on that lately. Does your supplement line uh, carry things to reduce inflammation? Um, because supplements aren't regulated by the FDA, I can't make a health claim, and inflammation is considered a disease state, even though I think it's a part of a normal biological function, in my opinion. So I can't say that it reduces inflammation, but there are, um, there are botanical ingredients that I have included that epigenetically interact and um, turn on genes that create more endogenous um, supply of antioxidants, which neutralize oxidative stress, which is essentially what causes inflammation in the body. So indirectly, they promote a healthy inflammatory response, is what I'm yeah. allowed to say. Homeostasis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had said um, that there were studies that showed that the parasympathetic system had been affected, which is like the gut and the bowel and things like that. Yeah. But you I thought you said too that sympathetic, like cortisol, which comes from right. you know, the automatic, the sympathetic. So are they both have been shown through studies to be affected? No, they reduce cortisol. So reduce cortisol, cortisol is associated with the sympath uh, sympathetic. Yes. Yeah, sympath yeah. What am I saying? Yeah, it's been a long day. Um, so that's the stress response right. version, right. and cortisol is a stress hormone. And so, so they've shown that it was decreased. Yeah. So studies have confirmed that after floating serum levels of cortisol have decreased in people, which is what makes you stressed out, you know, the cortisol. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Yeah? The gentleman was talking about research. I'm a one-time floater. I was the first time met probably about as long as that first speaker. I started floating in 1978. Wow. And when I look at my life and I look at the, you know, it's, it's, it's great to measure the effects of one float, but I actually think that floating is a, a process that really builds cumulatively, and that when you look at the cumulative effect of what it can do, mm -hmm. it's like, at this point, the whole research process is so messed up right. in terms of what funding goes for. It's like, if you can't make, you know, charge $10,000 a pill, you aren't going to get research funding the mm -hmm. way things are set up right now. Because yeah. we're, we're having to get creative about how we do this, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Which it sounds like you're really working it too. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, I, come, I'm glad I came out here. I, I don't have a float center right now, but I'm thinking about opening one. But somehow I knew that coming here was the right thing. Totally. Thanks. No problem. And thank you to all the other speakers too um, for being so awesome. So yeah, if there's no more questions. I guess we're wrapped up. We can mm -hmm. enjoy the rest.